Tobias's primary supervisor. Um, I think online we are joined today by Professor Bill Maley, um, possibly Doug Porte, and uh, Bjorn Dressel, who are also uh, members of, Bjorn, uh, of Tobias's uh, panel. Um, let me begin by acknowledging the Nanganwal and Nambri people, the traditional custodians of the country uh, on which I live and from where I'm speaking to you today. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Today, uh, Tobias is presenting his final seminar prior to submitting uh, his thesis for examination. Um, Tobias first enrolled with what was then SSGM, now DPA, in 2016 as an external student working on a part-time basis. And it's really great to see Tobias's uh, PhD journey nearing completion, a journey that has involved many challenges, not least those associated with having to balance his research work with his extremely demanding job. Tobias is a political, political economist with the World Bank and currently based in Islamabad. Uh, prior to joining the World Bank in 2012, he worked with the New Zealand Treasury and uh, the New Zealand Agency for International Development. Tobias's thesis uh, interrogates long-standing assumptions in international development practice um, about the relationship between public finance reform and social order, specifically the assumption that public finance reform in post-conflict settings helps to support social order through better service delivery and economic outcomes. Drawing on Mushtaq Khan's political settlements framework, Tobias's thesis critiques this assumption uh, in three case study post-conflict countries, namely Solomon Islands, Timor-Leste, and Afghanistan, all countries where Tobias has spent extended periods of time. In today's seminar, Tobias will present a summary of his main findings. Um, and I should say that today's seminar will be recorded and be made available to those uh, unable to listen in live today. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Tobias. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so thank you so much, everyone. For, thanks so much for joining. Uh, it's, it's nice to see everyone. And thanks especially to Sinclair uh, for, for all of the help and the introduction and, and the other members of my panel, Julian, Bill, Doug, um, also Tanoj and Amanda for the uh, administrative support. Really, really very welcome. So thanks so much. Um, uh, you know, Sinclair has done a great job uh, of introducing me, so I won't spend too much time on that, but just simply to say that, you know, th this is a thesis that really is um, core, not just to my research, but to my professional work and, and how I've really been spending my life for, for, for more than a decade working on these kinds of issues uh, in these countries and, and many others. Um, so the key question, uh, as, as uh, Sinclair's already outlined, is what impacts do attempts to reform public finance institutions have on social order in low-income post-conflict countries? Um, and why is this an interesting question? Why is this a relevant question? Well, because uh, obviously fragility, conflict and violence is seen as a critical problem of development. Uh, and it's a, a problem that international agencies are seeking more and more to try and solve. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But when international agencies go into uh, fragile states, they come with a certain toolbox of institutional reforms, a certain set of assumptions about what kind of institutional reforms will lead to improved outcomes in low-income fragile country environments. And those assumptions, that toolbox is informed by a, a specific set of, of ideologies. And it comes out of the good governance frameworks, it comes out of new public management, it comes out of a, a neoliberal view of the state, where the view of this, the, the function of the state is essentially to underpin the efficient operation of markets, 
uh, and through the efficient operation of markets, you can see improvements in social uh, society-wide resource allocation, leading to faster rates of economic growth, uh, job creation, improved service delivery, and through improved services, improved economic outcomes, the state is viewed as increasingly legitimate, which helps to mitigate uh, conflict pressures. So all good things come together. Uh, Good governance institutions bring economic growth, they bring services, that creates state legitimacy, state legitimacy, legitimacy creates social order and creates peace. Um, but I think there's a lot in the uh, literature that gives cause to question these assumptions, and, and there's nothing new about these, these challenges. It's, a, it's an application here in my research of, of uh, very well-established uh, theories of social uh, stability and state formation that really depend upon this idea that rent extraction and distribution is critical to social order. It's the capacity of political elites to extract rents and distribute them to political allies that underpins the political settlement, that underpins social order. And institutional reforms that attempt to constrain or undercut the capacity of political elites to extract and distribute rents can be destabilizing. Right. So there is this conflict in the literature between a good governance ideology and theories of state uh, state formation and social order that depend upon the extraction and distribution of economic rents. Right. Um, so I'm going to talk through this uh, a little bit more, unpack it a bit. But the research question, why it matters, my approach to studying that research, what I find in my case studies, and in some quick conclusions at the end. Um, Obviously, as I've already said, you know, what we're seeing around the world now is that problems of underdevelopment, problems of poverty are increasingly problems of fragility. Right? So, so while we see reductions in poverty around the world, we've seen poverty rates actually increase in fragile state settings. Uh, a growing share of the poor globally live in fragile states. And the international community has really picked this up as a problem, not just for poverty reduction, but also for the purposes of international security. Uh, mitigating international risk, addressing stability. So the World Bank and its new FCV strategy doesn't simply say that we're going to operate effectively in fragile states and deliver services. It says we're going to address the drivers of fragility, which is immensely ambitious when you kind of think about what's being said here, that development interventions can address the fundamental kind of political drivers of, of conflict and violence. And, and how is the international community going to do this? As I said before, this is this good governance model. It's the attempt, it's this belief that coming out of new public management in the 1980s and 1990s, that the state should focus on providing a core set of public goods in an efficient way. And if the state provides those underpinnings of markets, the private sector will do the rest, leading to strong economic growth uh, and improving living standards. And, and the, 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 the core part of this good governance framework is that the state itself cannot be trusted. Uh, public sector employees, politicians uh, are self-interested actors. They will seek opportunities to enrich themselves through their control of the state apparatus. So you need a powerful state to provide the public goods, health, education, infrastructure that underpin efficient markets, uh, property rights. But, you, but also you can't allow the state to become too powerful or the state starts to serve its own interests rather than the interests of the public. So how do you, how do you square the circle? Um, and the answer is this idea of, of accountability. You make the state accountable to the people and you constrain the, the range of activities that the state is involved in. So the state provides only the public goods that the private sector cannot provide. And the state is made accountable through transparency, through user choice, through citizen choice, uh, through electoral accountability loops. Everything that the state has done is published, is made publicly available so that the public can then observe the functions of the state. And if they don't like what they're saying, they can vote out their, uh, their politician and discipline uh, those those running the state to align the state's incentives with the broader public good, right? So you have this empowered actor who can use accountability loops through the electoral system or through their choice of provider uh, to discipline the state and improve 
public sector efficiency and effectiveness. And this is pervasive. This is this is the logic of development in many ways, and it is applied in, in all countries. Uh, but in fragile states, it's seen as just another case where this broad logic applies. Uh, and as I said before, the broad assumption being that if you have this institutional underpinnings being provided by the state, the private sector will grow, resource use within the economy will be efficient, public services will be provided efficiently, state legitimacy will therefore increase, and conflict, and pres conflict pressures will be reduced or ameliorated. The problem is, uh, as so often is the case, there's not much empirical evidence for this theory. Uh, from the kind of pure conflict empirics, uh, very little evidence that improving incomes or improving access to services leads to reductions in violence or reductions in conflict. And in fact, some evidence uh, that providing services in underserved poor communities or poor settings can increase contestation and violence. Um, and perhaps even more fundamentally, there is, as I've said, this, this theories of state formation and social order, including for very prominent economists such as Douglas North, Mushtaq Khan, that really argues that rent extraction and distribution is not just a pathology, it's not just a deadweight loss, it's not just a waste. Rent extraction and distribution is the glue that allows political elites to hold a political settlement together. If you have a whole bunch of powerful actors with access to violence, the capacity to bear arms, how do you enroll them in the state rather than have them fight the state or engage in conflict? Well, you buy them off. You, you distribute rents in a way that enroll them in the state building process. And that is not about uh, efficient markets. That's not about allowing efficient production. It's not about efficient allocation of social resources. It's about saying, look, we have no choice when a lot of people have guns, but to distribute rents in a way that gives them an incentive to participate in the system rather than to fight against the system. And that is obviously a super crude uh, summary of a very sophisticated and well-articulated theory, but but I think it's good enough for the purposes of, of, of this presentation and, and, and the broad story I'm trying to tell. Um, so how do I tell the story in, in relation to these uh, case study countries? So we've got the setup, right? We've got good governance theory that says public finance reform should be about efficiency and accountability and the delivery of, of a narrow range of public goods. Public finance should be about ensuring that there isn't wastage, that there isn't corruption, uh, and the public resources are really being used to deliver services most efficiently. Then you have this broader political economy theory that says, actually, in a fragile state, political actors need to be able to extract rents and distribute rents, including through a public finance system, which, by the way, is often controlling a very large share of overall public resources. And each of my case study countries, uh, you know, public spending approached 100% of GDP at various points. Um, so a very large share of public resources are being managed by public finance institutions. And, and there's an argument that the political elites need the capacity to direct those resources in ways that bring on board, that enroll armed actors to give them an incentive to participate in the state building process rather than fight against. And I'm going to look at that through basically application to three cases. Um, I'm using, I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on this. I'm using what a uh, historical institutionalist approach, um, case based, uh, qualitative, telling a story uh, based in time, looking at the details of how causal processes rolled out. So I'm not just looking at correlations, I'm not looking at uh, quantitative indicators, because I'm interested really in the, the underpinning causal processes in very complex systems. Uh, I use a clustered case study approach. So I'm looking at a population of low-income post-conflict countries. And within that population of low-income post-conflict countries, I've picked uh, countries that are, have variants on several other dimensions. So I can eliminate them as having, uh, a, 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 I can eliminate them as causal factors, right? So the countries that I've chosen have very different geographies. They have very different preceding colonial institutional arrangements. They had very different transitional governance arrangements, very different cultures, religions. So because I have that variance, I can say, look, the pattern I see is not simply because uh, 
it's a function of of a uh, a small Pacific island with a British colonial inheritance, right? Because I have variance against those uh, scope conditions. Um, all right. Uh, so moving on to the cases themselves, as as Sinclair's introduced, Solomon Islands, Timor Leste, Afghanistan, uh, all the three cases are, are countries that I've worked in, um, and what really kind of formed this puzzle in my head was an initial observation that in each of these countries, you could divide into two periods uh, of intervention bisected by a period of social disorder and change in government. Uh, and if we actually look both within cases and across cases, we see this counterintuitive result where periods where PFM reform implementation was relatively strong, so adherence to international good practices was relatively strong. Those were the periods in which social order seemed to be challenged or seemed to be deteriorating. Whereas periods where there was relatively weaker alignment to international good practice saw the sustainment or strengthening of social order. So a direct contradiction at first glance to the uh, correlational results we would expect to see from the existing policy literature. Whereas we would expect to say good practice, good governance, public finance institutions support social order, we see the opposite. So why is that? Um, and I developed two hypotheses to test through the research. Um, the first is uh, the one that I've talked about a little bit already, this idea that the introduction of good practice public finance institutions under, undermines the capacity of political elites to channel rents and resources to enroll powerful actors in the process of state formation. So because public finances are constrained on what can be spent, how it can be spent, the processes through which it can be spent. They lose the discretion, they lose the capacity to enroll actors in supporting uh, the new elite settlement. The second hypothesis is that political actors are not passive and purposes and, and process of institutional reform are contested. So what we see is that uh, over time, these introduced public finance institutions are captured and repurposed or bypassed. And through that capturing and repurposing, political elites regain the capacity to use these institutions to distribute rents. And, and that improvement and the alignment between the distribution of political power and economic benefits through this, this directed and discretionary distribution of rents allows for the strengthening of social order over time. So that's the hypotheses, that's the framing, and let's quickly run through the, the case studies themselves. Um, and, you know, I, I think I want to start by saying that obviously what I'm looking at here is um, causal processes that contribute to observed political outcomes. I'm not saying that the public finance institutions themselves were the, de the determinant or even the primary reason why we see these political outcomes. I'm simply saying that if we look at these public finance reforms, we can say that there's a, a causal contribution to the observed outcomes. Very complex systems. I'm, I'm not I'm trying to avoid being reductive or simplistic, uh, and, and and obviously no one factor ex explains everything, but but I think what we can see through uh, this kind of analysis is at least um, some uh, causal relationship and some contribution to the observed outcomes. So uh, let's start with Solomon Islands. I mean, I think this is a country that many of you know uh, very well. Um, and, and, and possibly much better than I do, but we used to have this protracted period of conflict, 1998 to 2003, uh, and most of the literature identifies the underlying drivers of that, that conflict as these long running historical patterns of uneconomic, uh, uneven economic development with the benefits of, of development being captured by Honiara, uh, by the public sector, uh, and this very extractive natural resource industry that was concentrating benefits. 
uh, the Asian financial crisis, 2000, uh, 1997, uh, and we see this falling international log prices leading to a, a fiscal and, and balance of payments crisis and this retrenchment of the state. So this uh, decline in public sector spending, decline in public sector employment, and this contraction of government subnational spending, which exacerbated these dynamics of uneconomic development and, and the, the uh, incapacitated the state from sharing those benefits more broadly, leading to this eventual outbreak of violence initially along ethnic lines, but very quickly turning into a generalized period of disorder, criminality, and predation. 2003, the uh, Regional Assistance Mission to Solomon Islands, very explicitly a state building intervention. Uh, we're set out to redesign the place, as Alexander Dana said. Um, this idea that the international community or as Australia and the regional partners would invest heavily in Solomon Islands to fix the institutions, to put the entire country on a different trajectory uh, towards uh, inclusive economic development. Uh, addressing conflict pressures uh, with a very explicit concern for the international security rep uh, repercussions of, of fragility and dysfunction at the local level in, in, in Solomon Islands. Uh, and a big part of this was the public finance reform. So you see heavy investment uh, by the Australian and New Zealand governments in providing technical assistance support in the central agencies, technical advisors and core control points within the public finance system, and this com almost complete adherence to good governance norms, right? So you see a very tight budget process. You see public finance, uh, public revenues being raised quite effectively from the Honiara private sector and public expenditures being allocated through um, good practice mechanisms on, on core public services, such as health and education uh, and some infrastructure. Uh, you see competitiveness and in, in public sector hiring to some extent and, and competitiveness in procurement uh, with this idea that that, that competitiveness leads to efficiency. Um, as that uh, intervention was sustained and economic growth resumed, what we saw was the continuation of these previous patterns of uneconom uh, uneven economic development with the, the Honiara aid economy um, actually exacerbating this, this unevenness and exacerbating these periphery regional tensions. Uh, this perceptions of, of, of peripheral exclusion eventually boiling over into the Honiara riots of 2006, uh, where a, a predatory, exclusive political elite uh, that were viewed as corrupt and extractive were seen as having the protection of the international uh, security forces, um, leading to this, this kind of uh, period of uh, this, uh, this renewed explosion of, of, of disorder and, and violence. Um, and then you see this kind of reconfiguration of the, the political settlement after that. So the second period, 2007 onwards, uh, you see this rapid increase in government development spending. You see rapid increases in constituency development fund spending, uh, rapid increases in public sector hiring and remuneration, uh, and um, uh, elite provisioning through scholarship spending. So scholarships uh, being uh, allocated to uh, elites and their, their their allies and their families, uh, all of which were wide departures from good governance, public finance logics, and very explicitly aimed at provisioning, uh, providing economic benefits to excluded groups. And what that really allowed for was a stabilization of the settlement uh, and an institutionalization of, of political competition with no return to violence, despite the withdrawal of international security forces over that period. And just to give some uh, numbers here uh, on the kind of extent to which this was occurring, you know, you see the uh, development budget spending increasing by, from 36 million to 584 million Solomon dollars over the period, uh, and very few of those projects going through any kind of uh, investment management assessment or cost benefit analysis. Constituency development spending increasing by 1600% to come to account to one third of the total development budget. Tertiary scholarship spending coming to account for 20% of total development spending. Uh, and this explosion in public sector spending with a 16% increase in public sector numbers 
and a 23% pay increase uh, overall. So 23% increase in remuneration. And, uh, you know, the, the, this being very frankly uh, acknowledged as it's being driven by nepotism and patronage in public sector hiring rather than any real improvements in the capacity of the state to deliver. Um, second case study country, uh, Timor-Leste, uh, and, and again, I'll skip through very, very quickly. Um, uh, obviously, we had the, the long period of Indonesian occupation uh, and then eventual independence in, in, in 1999 with a large uh, UN uh, transitional administration and state building presence. Um, you saw, again, this, this idea of building a state from scratch, uh, turning utopia into a reality, to, to, to quote the SRSG at the time, uh, this idea that state building could be done at a very large scale and good governance institutions could be implanted. Uh, we saw the uh, similar focus on public finance institutions uh, and the similar adherence to good governance. You saw a very low, uh, actually quite low government spending to start with, uh, reflecting the fiscal constraints, um, no fiscal deficits, available public resources being allocated to core public goods, um, efforts to establish competition in hiring and procurement, um, uh, and and uh, overwhelming uh, allocation of public resources to to uh, core public services. Um, uh, this happened against the political background in which the the and I can see Sue Ingram's uh, on online and and I've drawn from her work extensively and talking about this, but the political institutions being captured by a, a narrow group of the political elite. Um, at the same time as the economic benefits of uh, development were being concentrated and, and, and there, frankly, were not a lot of economic uh, dividends being generated through this political system. As the aid flows declined, uh, this provision of public service really choked off the provisioning capacities of the public finance system. Uh, and in this combination of a very kind of autocratic and, and narrow form of governance combined with very limited access to economic benefits leads to this erosion of uh, political order leading to this new explosion of violence in 2007. Following 2007, you have a complete reconfiguration. Again, you have Guzmao taking over with a much more inclusivist model of governance. And he quickly takes control of these public finance institutions and uses them explicitly for provisioning, for, for, for building alliances, for bringing in allies, for building constituents for the political process. Um, and you see this broad range of elites mobilized in support of this the system, this this political settlement, um, and, and you see no return to violence over the subsequent period. So you see the stabilization through this institutionalization uh, underpinned by the broad distribution of benefits through the public finance system. And again, to give some quite striking examples of this, uh, what we see over the period is, is government spending increasing from 25% of GDP to 116% of GDP. Um, and that being underpinned by uh, unsustainable drawdowns from the petroleum fund, up to $900 million a year. You see veteran pensions increasing from $64 million to $400 million in 2015, um, rapidly outstripping uh, any spending on social protection. Uh, you saw discretion in procurement with most uh, procurement, large-scale procurement is not going through any competitive processes, uh, and you see this patronage-driven civil service hiring with an explosion in public sector employment and public sector pay uh, through very uh, nepotistic and discretionary channels of, of selection, hiring, and promotion. Um, final case study, uh, Afghanistan, uh, which is a bit of a, a, a different case. So, uh, again, what we saw following the uh, U.S. intervention in 2001, a deliberate attempt at building, uh, on the one hand, a good governance state, at least on paper, theoretically, a large advisor presence, efforts to establish uh, a, a budget process and public finance institutions that adhered to good governance norms. Um, at at the same time and in parallel, the security driven influx of aid that was very explicitly driven by the need to enroll 
regional warlords and regional commanders in the state building process. So on the one hand, building up public finance institutions, on the other hand, international actors mobilizing enormous resources, eight to $10 billion per year, completely bypassing the same government systems that they were establishing uh, in order to provide benefits to the regional warlords and regional commanders that they needed to contribute uh, and, and participate in the fight against the Taliban. This being done through provincial reconstruction teams, uh, off-budget projects, um, very large scale, I mean, socially transformative in terms of the scale of the spending um, uh, and very explicitly directed with this political purpose in mind of, of paying off warlords to get them to participate in, in, in the fight against the Taliban. And what this led to was during this first period up to 2014 is a relatively stable non-Taliban uh, political settlement, so exclusive of the Taliban, uh, a Kabul elite that, that was relatively cohesive, um, and, and the capacity of the state to act in a coordinated way. From 2014 elections, you see a number of things happen at once. You see the contested outcomes of the 2014 elections between Ashraf Ghani uh, and Abdullah Abdullah. You see rapid de declines um, in international aid flows, including much of the off-budget spending with the reduction in uh, the international security presence following the Obama surge. Uh, and then you see a, a increase in Taliban uh, violence and, 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 and Taliban control uh, as the insurgency was strengthened. Um, what this leads to is a sharp reduction in off-budget aid flows and, and a sharp increase in the proportion, the, not the amount, but the proportion of public spending that is going through the formal public finance systems that had been established over the preceding period. Right? So all of a sudden, public finance, these institutions that have been established for managing public finances start to matter much more than they did in the preceding period, because on-budget spending is accounting for a much greater share of total spending than the, the, the security-driven aid flows. At the same time, Ashraf Ghani comes in with a very good governance-driven ideological worldview and attempts to drive these reforms to the public finance system, centralizing revenues um, from provincial uh, collection points, uh, introducing reforms to the development budget to prevent the politicization of development spending uh, and the channeling of, of patronage to MPs through development projects, and moves to improve uh, competition and hiring and in procurement. So you see uh, this efforts to move towards good governance and public finance institutions very explicitly and very rigorously pursued uh, by the Ghani administration, not all of which were successful, all of which were contested, all of which were uh, undermined at best in a piecemeal way and in a very dysfunctional environment but real attempts to frontally attack some of the aid flows, so some of the rent flows that had been underpinning the previous settlement. Uh, and what we see is that as, this, uh, as a result of this, is this increasing instability among the non-Taliban political elites. We see this, uh, this emergence of this parallel government between Abdullah and Ghani, which paralyzes the executive. We see the MPs coming out and kind of uh, outright rebellion against the president uh, and, and the government, the executive becoming entirely dependent upon uh, legislative decree to get anything done because the parliament simply won't approve uh, any legislative changes. And this kind of elite disorganization, this uh, incapacity of, of the non-Taliban elite to organize itself, um, leading to the outright collapse following the U.S. withdrawal in 2021. Now, I think, I think obviously, many causal processes involved here. I'm not saying this was the cause of the collapse of the Republic, but I'm saying that this was certainly a contributing factor. Uh, and the pace at which the, the, the Republic collapsed um, following the U.S. troop withdrawal did surprise many commentators, and, and many people, I think, have have argued that it was a result partly of this internal disorganization, this internal incoherence among the non-Taliban elite. Um, so I think I've really talked through the slide already, but but that's just some of the examples of how these institutional changes that were intended to move towards good practice actually ended up narrowing the settlement and excluding those who previously had been 
included. Okay, so that's the that's the three case studies, uh, and I I think we're coming yeah. So we're at good time. So let me just skip through the uh, conclusions and the implications, uh, and then we can open up for questions. Just to kind of recap a little bit, right? So so there's this idea, this ideology animating international development that by implanting a specific set of good governance institutions in any country in the world, we can enable the effective operation of markets, which allows the private sector to become dynamic and do its thing in allocating resources to their most productive use, which then leads to economy-wide improvements in living standards, and that supports social order and uh, peace through improving living standards and state legitimacy. So all good things come together and that these institutions will have the same effect with it wherever they are implemented. So it doesn't matter about context, you can use this institutional toolkit to achieve the set of good outcomes wherever they are implemented. Uh, and the empirical and theoretical basis for this uh, set of assumptions is very weak. The, the empirical literature linking economic development, service delivery, and conflict, uh, very inconclusive, and, and, and lots of the literature, especially from SLRC and others, really pointing towards it being much more contingent on the way in which the institutions function, the way in which government functions. So I think the, 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 the way you maintain a political settlement is through giving uh, armed actors, a, a, or those with, those with the capacity to mobilize, a shared stake in the maintenance of the system, and that is done through the distribution of rents, the distribution of economic benefits. And in low-income post-conflict countries, the public sector is a major player in this process. Public sector accounts for a large proportion of total activity in the economy. Uh, aid rents are enormous. Uh, so, so a key channel through which rents can be distributed is the public finance system. And that requires a fundamentally different set of capacities to those imagined by the good governance institutional forms. It's not about efficiency. It's not about competition. It's not about effectiveness. It's about providing rents in a way that allows uh, powerful actors to be enrolled. Uh, and because of this contradiction, we see efforts to implement good practice systems having perverse outcomes in that specific institutional context. We see efforts to introduce good governance public finance systems contributing to social disorder. Uh, and as a result of that, we see uh, these uh, contested processes by which public finance institutions are then captured and repurposed by local political actors to better serve the rent extraction and rent distribution purposes that need to be met in fragile state settings. Um, in terms of the implications of all of this, I mean, I, I think essentially that the, the key point is, is not a new one at all, and it's just adding to a very large literature that points this out, that institutional forms have very different impacts in different historical and social contexts, and it is critical that development agencies and international actors take that kind of variance into account when trying to design or predict the implications of specific institutional reforms and in given country settings. Um, let me stop there. I, I, uh, I hope we have some time for, for discussion uh, and, and thank you very much again.